We've been talking about the real life, everyday, ordinary battle that we face to experience the purposes and the plans of God for our lives. We're doing this from the book of Ephesians, so if you want to join me there, it's at the end of a short book, just a letter to a group of believers in a city called Ephesus that is today in modern-day Western Turkey. And the Apostle Paul is trying to spur them on to acknowledge how practical and how every day is the reality that God's purposes and plans for your life are being actively undermined and attempted to be thwarted by the evil one. Simply because you are a creation of God, and you are, made in God's image, you are, you do not automatically experience God's purpose and plan for your life. Though you experience much of His goodness, much of His common graces, you receive breath in your lungs, whether you reject God or love Him, you can see the beauty of creation around you, you can participate in productive work, you have joy in the relationships around you, food tastes good, sleep is mostly restful. These are common graces of God that you get to experience, but you don't automatically experience God's purposes and plans for your life. He even says to believers, this is who he wrote explicitly to, those who had believed that Jesus was the Savior of the world and the future returning King. He's trying to convince them as he's trying to convince us if we're in Christ, simply because we have the Spirit in us, simply because we are worshipers of Christ, we will not automatically experience all of the purposes and plans that God has for our lives because we live in a contested time. Your life does not play out in a vacuum. The effect of gravity upon the world is not moving it towards God, but moving it towards chaos and corruption. This is true of our own souls apart from the work of Christ. And what Paul wants us to be mindful of, apart from our willful participation in taking on both the the protection and the equipment that God has given to us, we won't experience what God has for us in this life. So right before Paul is talking about the armor of God or spiritual warfare, as Christians often refer to it, he gives us instruction about marriage, about family life, about our working life, I think, to help us have the proper perspective that spiritual warfare isn't some elevated class of spiritual experience. Spiritual warfare is not only for those who are well-studied in the Scriptures, who have lived a life of devotion to Christ for many, many years and have obtained like some plateau of godliness. Spiritual warfare affects the one who is brand new in Christ, the one who is not in Christ at all, and the one who has followed Christ for decades and decades. If you want to experience more and more of what God has for your life, His plans, His purposes, His power, His presence, you have to avail yourself to both the protection He gives you and the weapons He gives you. This is what Paul describes in the end of Ephesians chapter 6. Let's read together. And then we will consider this morning um, the sword of the Spirit, the primary offensive weapon that God gives us. This is the word of the Lord, beginning in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. May the Lord bless all who hear his word. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm." Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. This is the Word of the Lord. We live in a contested time. Paul begins this section in verse 12 talking about wrestling. And now towards the end of the section, he talks about the sword of the Spirit. The sword that he references is a short sword. Uh, Machaira is the Greek word. It's the sword that a Roman foot soldier would have carried with him at all times, right on his waist in a scabbard for ready use. It's short, 12 to 18 inches long is the blade. It's meant for hand-to-hand combat. Most of our images of warfare today, we picture airplanes launching missiles. We picture aircraft carriers that can shoot a projectile to the other side of the globe. We picture warfare being far off. This image is ancient warfare. It's hand-to-hand. It's, it's personal. You live a con- in a contested time. There is only one... The evil one, the devil, is hounding you personally. Most likely, you will go your entire life without any personal confrontation with the devil. You will have much interaction with those below his authority, demons. Even more of us will have interaction with the fallenness of the world that the evil one animates. When we consider spiritual warfare, don't picture you are in hand-to-hand combat with the devil. It's difficult to discern between the three great enemies of the plan and the purposes of God that Christians have long identified, Paul points them out earlier in Ephesians, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Good luck. I wouldn't waste your effort trying to determine what specifically is a temptation from the evil one, what is a temptation of the fallenness of the world in which you live, and what is a temptation by your own inward evil corrupt desire. The sword of the Spirit is the weapon against all of them. All of these things, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, used to leverage against the people of God. You are engaged in a personal battle for that which God desires in your life. I want to start this morning by considering how Jesus used the sword of the Spirit. Six or eight weeks ago, in a series we did on the schemes of the devil, we looked uh, for a whole morning at Luke chapter 4. So I'll just remind you of a couple things briefly, and then I want to spend the rest of our time this morning trying to inspire you with the power of God's Word. It is a sword that yielded, even remotely effectively, is incredibly powerful. Jesus used this sword in Luke chapter 4. I'll show you this all on the screen. I just want you to see the pattern and be reminded of it. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit, meaning that he lived a life in complete dependence upon and obedience to the will of God the Father. Jesus is full of the Spirit. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the evil one. Three times, Luke records specific temptations of the evil one, and all three times, Jesus responds with the Word of God. Think about that. Jesus, who is himself God, is filled with the Spirit, and he is quoting the written Word of God. If this is the weapon that Jesus takes up when he is in personal conflict with the devil, the devil, Jesus, pulls out the sword that is the word of God, we would do likewise to acknowledge this is the weapon that God has given us. So, three times Jesus is tempted. He responds, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He's tempted again. Jesus responds, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Again, Jesus is tempted, and he answered, it is said, this is the word of God, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
And then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Jesus used it, and we do well to do likewise. I think of the elements of the armor, the sword is the one that most lends itself to skillful use and a consideration of asking yourself the question, do you use it? Do you know how to use it? Right? The helmet sort of does its job whether you participate or not. If you just put it on, it works. You may forget to put on the chin strap or may fail to put the visor down, but you're going to get a lot of protection just by putting the thing on. Same with the breastplate of righteousness. I mean, just in the imagery, think about it. Once you put the breastplate on, it's there. Once you got the shoes on, it's there. Once you put the belt on, it's there. The shield, like we considered last week, it's a big shield, like two and a half feet wide by four feet tall. It's not rocket science. Get behind the shield. It works. A sword now is different. What good is a sword if you don't get it out of the scabbard? What good is the sword if you grab the wrong end? Ooh, who does that? You have to know how to use the sword. Jesus used the sword. We do likewise. So I want to inspire you this morning with my own testimony of how I have seen the scriptures function as a sword in my own life. I want to share with you about uh, money, about sex, about conflict, about trials, about wisdom, about anxiousness, about learning to navigate your own heart. The Word of God is a sword. Do you use it? Do you know how to use it? We have said many times when we gather as a church, you cannot grow deep in faith in Christ aside from spending time with God in His Word. There's no secrets and there's no shortcuts It would be like telling a Roman soldier to go out and engage battle with the enemy. And he says, well, I don't really know how to use my sword. And you say, well, don't really worry about it. It's not that important. Use your sword. Well, no one ever taught me. Uh, Time to learn now. Use your sword. I don't, it feels heavy. I don't know how. Learn to use it. It is powerful. Now, you don't need to be an expert swordsman for the sword to be powerful and useful, do you? Can a three-year-old pick up a sword? Would that be comforting to you or would that make you nervous? Nervous, why? Because your three-year-old is an excellent swordsman or because swords are dangerous? The latter. I want to spur you on this morning. You know you should know the Word of God. Most of you probably have some latent guilt that you don't know it as well as you should. And we settle for some really lame excuses. Like, I don't really like to read. I'm not good at memorizing. Come on, we're not going to waste our time pointing out to the silliness of those excuses. Instead, I want to motivate you the short The sword is sharp, and it's powerful, and it works. And you don't have to be an excellent swordsman to stab the devil in the chest, to stab the lies that you believe right through the eyes. You don't have to be excellent to do damage with the sword. Picture even the most unwieldy three-year-old picking up a sword and flailing that thing around. How close are you going to get? Just pick up the sword and start flailing. Shoot, grab that thing with two hands and spin around in a circle over and over and over again. It will probably give you some protection because the sword is powerful and the very sword of the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. Okay, let's make this practical. Let's talk about money. Maybe I am more prone than you are towards materialism or to comfort for my future about having money. I look at my 401k, when it's up, I feel better about the future. That is sad, but it's part of living in a fallen world. 
I am tempted sometimes to enjoy the luxurious things that other people have because I generally can't afford them. And I like to imagine myself in those things and I feel better. Like I can feel in my heart is a temptation to find too much value in money. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. When I feel the temptation towards material riches as my source of comfort, as my source of hope, as my source of identity, of significance, of well-being, often I have pulled out this sword and am reminded No, I need to keep my life free from the love of money and be content with what I have because God has said, I won't ever leave you. I have God. I don't need a nicer vehicle. I would welcome one if you want to give me one, but I don't need one. I have God. Later in my life, I came across this passage in Timothy And as we're talking about the Bible, it's okay if you don't know where it lives. Pick up the sword and start flailing it around. In one of the Timothys, it teaches, I think it's 1 Timothy chapter 6, about wealth. This verse, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I have warned myself with this truth many times. Maybe these are passages of scripture that you don't know and some of these are going to be new to you, write down a reference, write it down. Maybe this is one of the first times you learn to use the sword because the devil will whoop you. He is a liar. He's more conniving than we are. He's often more diligent than we are. If you don't know how to use the sword, if you don't have passages of scripture that you can pull out at a moment's notice, get one this morning and use it. Keep your lives free from the love. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Why let my heart grow in affection to material riches? It's a root of all kinds of evil. Congratulations, you are a multimillionaire. And if you love money, you have invited into your life all manner of evil. Not worth it. Okay, so... It, one season in my life, I found some comfort, like, I don't love money. I mean, to love money, that's a serious problem. I have problems, but I don't love money. It was not till a later season in life that I realized this next verse is actually the statement immediately preceding it. Those who desire to get rich fall into a trap. It was like, My flesh says to me, Zach, do you love money? I'm like, no, come on. I don't love money. Do you desire to be rich? Duh, who doesn't? Not good. This is a powerful tool against my own inward craving for more. Let's talk about sex. I was a college student wrestling with lust. I was not engaged in a sexual relationship. I was a virgin until we got married by God's grace and kindness. That was a wonderful gift to me. I'm wrestling with lust. Sometimes I like to ask you questions and have you by a show of hands agree with me. I'll spare you on this one, so don't actually do it unless you want other people to know you struggle with lust. Raise your hand if you struggle with lust. Don't do it. I'll put mine up for you. Okay, this is a common problem. I was a college student. I don't know who introduced me to this verse. It's Job 31.1. You just get a sword out, and it says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. It's possible. There was something about that truth. The number of times that has come back to my mind when I am tempted to lust, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. I don't have to. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I thought as a young man before I was married, I really looked forward to getting married for all of the benefits, in particular, the sexual benefits. I imagined, because I knew firsthand, it's difficult to pursue a life of purity physically and in your thoughts and in your attitudes when you're not married and you want to be married. 
I learned the hard way in marriage, it doesn't get easier. For those of you who are young that are struggling to pursue sexual purity now, learn how to do it now. Learn how to use the Word of God now because when you get married, it actually, in my experience, becomes even more difficult because now you know what the water tastes like and you now you know how refreshing the well is and there's a whole different series of temptations. So around our one-year anniversary, I find myself in South Carolina trying to make it, the most semi of semi-professional indoor football teams. Just like janky, low budget, just nothing glamorous about it. By myself in South Carolina with a whole group of guys I've never known. We're living in this apartment. I found myself down in the living room. I think it was the morning, but I don't really know. I can picture where I was sitting when somehow, I don't know how the Spirit took me to this passage. Maybe someone told me about it. I don't remember. I find myself reading in the Old Testament this gem of a truth. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, seeking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I can't ever remember if it's in 1 Chronicles or 2 Chronicles. It's on the screen now. It's chapter 16, verse 9. I'm not sure which book. It's not important to know where it lives. It's important to know the truth. There I was as a young man, knowing that I was feeling the difficulty of pursuing purity in how I thought and how I wanted to live with a group of men who did not share that value, getting ready to celebrate a one-year anniversary with my wife that I love dearly and find very attractive. There I am feeling alone, and I get this truth that the eyes of the Lord, they're scouring the earth, looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The number of times I have pulled out that little beauty and been reminded it pushes back the lies of the evil one. It pushes back the wayward desire of my own flesh because the sword is powerful. Many times related to sexual temptation, I have remembered, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you to you. Resist the devil. Just pick up the sword and start flailing it around. You may be the most incompetent swordsman, but the sword is sharp. Uh, this time you have to raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings. Those of you who have your hands down, God be merciful to your soul. <laughs> it is so good. You're missing out. Anyway, if you have the privilege of having an elvish blade, you have a sword that the elves crafted. Those of us Lord of the Rings fans are already knowing where I'm going. When the orcs come around, you don't even have to take your sword out of the hilt. It begins to glow blue. You don't have to be an expert swordsman to make the orc afraid of your sword when it's blue because they know the power of the sword. Use the sword just resist the devil. He will flee from you. And you draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Conflict. I am not exempt from conflict. None of us are exempt from conflict. At work, at home, especially at home. I mean, if you have a conflict-free marriage, write me a book and I will accuse you of lying about it because there's no such thing as a conflict-free marriage. You've got conflict with the wife, conflict with the kids. There's just conflict everywhere. Those of you who are at work who have a position of responsibility and authority, you got conflict because you just make people mad. You can't do everything everybody wants and they don't like you for it. That's just how it works. Nobody is exempt from conflict we all seem to instinctively know where conflict comes from. When you're the husband, don't you dare agree with me, men. This is a trap. I'm telling you now. This is a trap. Don't fall into it. You can know as a husband whose fault is it. Hers. Can I get an amen? Don't do it. <laughs> you have conflict with somebody at work. Whose fault is it? Theirs. You have conflict with your kids. Whose fault is it? Theirs. Don't we just instinctively know that? Sometime when Hillary and I were first in marriage, I don't remember how long, 
I think I was introduced to this truth by a sermon that I heard a pastor teach, I think. James chapter 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? No, I disagree. (laughs) I think they actually come from others. No, the truth is it comes from within you. The number of times in conflict with Hillary where the Lord has brought this back to my mind. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You cannot have what you want. You kill and you covet. That is a powerful sword. I don't look for the source of my conflict in others. It's in my own twisted and corrupt desires. What's the best way to get out of conflict? What do you do when you're in conflict? You've got a fight going on. You did think it was their fault, but the Word of God has reminded you, no, look for the seed of it in you. The vast majority of time, it's in you. What do you do about it? Same paragraph, James says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. God will lift you up. In conflict, we tend to defend ourselves. We want to prove our point. How many fights have you had in your marriage where you say the same thing on repeat, she says the same thing on repeat, and you're just trying to convince each other that your point is better and that you're right? Completely ineffective. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. You go to God and you say, I am sorry, I was wrong. Help me understand my fault. You go to your spouse and you say, I am sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? The sword is sharp and it's powerful. Humble yourself. Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before others. Jesus said, the meek inherit the earth. You do not need to defend yourself. You don't need to advocate for yourself. If you find yourself trying to convince those around you that you're not at fault, foolish, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. What about trial and difficulty? Anybody got problems? Jeez, sign me up. We got problems. I don't know when in the season of life that I learned this passage. But I've quoted it so many times in so many different circumstances to myself, against the evil one, against my own ulterior motives, against my temptation to feel sorry for myself. I, I don't know if you struggle with this. When things get hard for me, I'm resilient for quite a while. Like, I've got a bit of a fighting spirit, a resilient spirit. But then if I have to keep persevering, I just want to, like, call it a day, take a nap, knock it out of bed. I just, like, I call it reality avoidance syndrome. I want to feel sorry for myself. This truth won't let you. James says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. The Holy Spirit lives in me, not because I'm special as a Christian. The same Spirit that lives in me lives in all of those who are in Christ. And that Spirit in you wants maturity in Christ more than anything. The Spirit in you wants God more than anything. And if you are going to have more of God, if you are going to be mature in your faith, you are going to experience trials and suffering because a deep faith is a muscle that must be exercised. Nobody gets big muscles by asking God for big muscles. You get big muscles by sitting yourself under the weight and moving that thing. And the more you move it, the bigger your muscles get. That's how it works. Faith is similar. The power is God, so you do ask him, God, give me a deep, strong faith, and he's going to say, okay, let's exercise this muscle. It's necessary. So instead of feeling sorry for yourself, instead of wondering why God is allowing this difficulty into your life, 
I mean, have a good pity party. It's okay. Just get it out of your system. And then get the sword out that says, no, I ought to consider this pure joy. I don't. That's why I need the scripture to remind me that it actually is joy because God is deepening my faith. Any trial that you're in, any suffering that you're in, There's lots of verses that you can know, but you got to at least know one. How are you going to navigate life if you don't know one sword to get out when the evil one tempts you to despair or discouragement? When the evil one says to you, God is giving you a raw deal. God isn't paying attention to you. James is what I use. Let's talk about wisdom. You ever have a hard time making decisions? not knowing what to do. How do you make a difficult decision between lots of decent options? How do you make a really consequential decision when you don't have all of the information that you want? How do you make a really important decision that is going to alter the trajectory of your life or the lives of others? We have to make difficult decisions If any of you lacks wisdom, like, oh, the Bible is talking to me. The Spirit is talking to me. If any of you lacks wisdom, yep, that's me. Well, then the Word of God tells us what to do. This is a sword. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Boom. I mean, wow. Need wisdom? Have a difficult decision to make? Ask God with confidence that he will give it to you, and he will. This is all true. A passage of scripture that I've learned in the past year, six months ago, nine months ago, I'm not really sure, Um, in the responsibility that I have currently to help care for the other campuses of the chapel, I have very often found myself feeling overwhelmed, not sure what to do, not knowing what is the right thing to do, and just feeling like you can kind of see a way out, but it's like so far out there, you easily get discouraged, and then something else happens. I mean, you've had experiences like this. As soon as you think you have clarity, something else happens, and it's like, ah, you get lost again and confused. When I find myself feeling disoriented and like needing an anchor, I, um, I often turn to the Proverbs of Scripture. I'm not sure why. They they just, they feel old to me. They feel stable to me. There, to me, feels like there's a security in the mystery. It's like, I don't, they just remind me like God is vast and enormous and I'm just a wee little guy and it's good. God is good and he's over all things. It's okay. Somehow the Proverbs help me feel that settledness. So I was reading the Proverbs six months ago, nine months ago, 10 months ago. I'm not sure. I was sitting in the chair at home that I often read scripture in in the morning and spend time with God, and I came across this little beauty. I don't think I've memorized it right. This is how I always think of it. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. You can fact check me. I don't think that's exactly what it said. But when I'm out there wielding the sword against the evil one, (laughs) I'm feeling pretty good about that. That's the truth. The evil one is not going to say to me, ooh, your sword's sword's not very sharp, you misquoted that verse. No, go ahead, try this one on. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. Sometimes life is confusing and overwhelming. When you need wisdom and you're working to be wise and to understand and do the right thing and it just isn't happening as fast as you think it should, How comforting is it to know that when you're on the path of the righteous, well, just like the sun that rises, that gives greater and greater light as the day goes on, so is the path of the righteous. These are all ways that the sword is powerful and sharp. Do you know how to use it? Don't waste your time with some semblance of guilt you feel sorry for yourself, you don't know the Bible, know the Bible. You can learn it. It's okay if you don't like to memorize. I'd push you on that actually quite a bit because you know lots of song lyrics. Before you had a GPS, you know how to get places in your car. 
You remember people's names at work. You generally remember where you put your wallet or your keys. You know which car is yours. Haven't you ever thought of that? You who say, my memory isn't very good. I mean, come on, do you walk out into the mall parking lot and are like, oh my goodness, I forget which vehicle I own. No, it may have happened to you one time, but come on. You have a great mind. God has given you one. Learn to use the sword. Start with one verse in any one of these areas. Here's another one, anxiousness. I don't know anybody that doesn't struggle with the temptation to be anxious. Like I feel a tightness in my chest. Sometime when I'm sitting in bed, if I'm thinking about anxious thoughts, that's like thinking about the future as though bad things are going to happen and God isn't there. That makes you anxious. Sometimes sitting in bed, I get this tightness right here in my chest. Like, No, that's not a heart attack. I've had this before. Just making sure it doesn't travel down my left arm. It never has yet, but I can feel it right there. And I can feel this temptation to be anxious. And here's the truth. It often comes back to my mind. Let your reasonableness or your gentleness be known to everyone. And here's like the core of it that helps me almost every time. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious. I don't want to be anxious. Nobody enjoys being anxious. It's miserable. When you are reminded that the Lord is near, it calms anxiety. But if you don't know that truth, well, then what are you going to tell? What do you tell yourself? You just breathe deep. That's valuable. Go for a walk. That might help you. Take a shower. That might help. Talk to a friend. That would probably help. What are you going to remind yourself? What are you going to tell yourself? Do you have a sword to use? Last area, and then we'll, we'll finish. All who develop maturity in Christ learn to navigate the motives and the intentions of their heart. Jesus brings this to the forefront in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. A parallel is children growing to adulthood. When a child is young and you're raising a child, you just tell them what to do. And you give them consequences if they don't do it. You reward them for the right. You punish them for the bad. It's how you raise a child initially. And it's not rocket science. It can be difficult, but it, I think it's much more commonly overcomplicated in our day and time. You give a kid food. They should be grateful. You tell them, you say thank you. You just consequence, reward. It's behavior. This is the thing we do. We get on the bus at this time. I take you this place at this time. You're making all the decisions for the child. You get this. As a child grows, the wise parent begins to teach them to navigate their heart, your own motive, your own purposes, your own intention, so that as your child grows and they're mean to their sister and you say, come on, you shouldn't have said that. What do you say? And she says, sorry. Don't talk to your sister that way. Sorry. Yeah, no, we're not having that. When you're a toddler, I'm going to let that go, and I'm just going to make you say sorry. As you grow, I'm going to pull you aside and say, does it seem unreasonable that you should apologize to your sister? Why is it that you have such a difficult time taking responsibility for that? And when I'm at my sanctified best... I'm going to help them consider how God helps us navigate our heart and what God has done for us that enables us to take responsibility, to apologize, and how God actually gives us hope that we can treat each other with love and kindness. You have to learn to navigate your heart. The sword of the Spirit is effectively effectively effective. It's incredibly effective at helping you learn to navigate your heart. Proverbs 4, one of the ones I go to regularly. Above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Be careful about what you put in your ears. Don't mindlessly scroll on Facebook. That's foolish. Guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. What you listen to matters. What you watch matters. What you speak matters. The people you hang out with matter. Guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Why would you pee in your own well? Terrible idea. Don't do it. 
Guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Psalm 139. It ends. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Our motives are confusing. The heart of a man is deep water, but a man of understanding draws him out. It can be confusing to learn to navigate your own heart. The Word of God gives you clarity. The Word of God, we'll end with this, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Same kind of sword. The author of Hebrews and Paul use the same image, same short sword for hand-to-hand combat. The word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Use it. Even if in your lack of training, all you can do is grab it out and it feels unwieldy in your hand and too heavy. That sucker is sharp and it's dangerous. Just start flailing that thing around. And when you see how powerful and effective it is, you will find yourself much more motivated to all of a sudden memorize passages of the Bible, spend time listening to the Bible as you drive or as you work out, or reading the Bible. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Let me pray for us and then we'll close in worship. Thank you, Father, for the sword. Thank you that you have honed the edges of the sword, that it is sharper than any blade any man has ever made. Thank you, Father, that there is no armor that can withstand the sword of the Spirit. Why don't you just take a moment quietly and process or pray as the Spirit would lead you and the band will lead us in song when it's time. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.